Hello and welcome to video lecture number 65. Today we are talking about reformed visions and this encompasses the years 1880 to 1892. For our subsections today we have electoral politics after reconstruction, new initiatives in the 1880s, and the populist program. So we're we're, we're looking at a return now to some of the political history that we're used to. Um, so the undoing of Reconstruction involved not only the defeat of Republican governments in the former Confederate states, but also a retreat from the activism of the federal and state governments, uh, north as well as south, that had characterized the Republican Party. Um, and this was during the Civil War and the early post-war years. The economic depression that followed the Panic of 1873 led businessmen to oppose public spending, borrowing, and taxes. Uh, hard times contributed to the Democrats' recapture of the House of Representatives in 1874. This midterm victory of the Democrats, who held a narrower view of government than, than the Republicans, ushered in a period of generally divided government in Washington, D.C. From the late 1870s into the 1890s, national politics remained intensely partisan and highly competitive, but it no longer involved sustained debate over national issues of fundamental importance. Now, however unimaginative and limited national government appeared during the late 19th century, uh, politics engaged not only party leaders and workers, but also the citizenry. The rank and file frequently attended political gatherings and, of greater significance, regularly voted in impressively large numbers. The political parties' coalitions were primarily based on cultural identities, uh, religious, ethnic, racial, and regional, uh, rather than on economic class or occupation. Once formed, political party identifications proved to be enduring. Uh, even across generational lines. Thus, voters who became disaffected with their party in particular situations were more likely to abstain on election day than to vote for the opposing party. So let's dive in and have a closer look at reform visions with our first section, electoral politics after Reconstruction. In the 1880s and 90s, uh, labor unions and agrarian or farmers groups took the lead in critiquing the new industrial order and demanding change. Over time, more and more middle class and elite Americans also took up the call, eventually earning the name progressives. On the whole, uh, middle class progressives proposed more limited measures than radical labor and farm advocates did. Uh, but since they wielded more political clout, they often had greater success in winning passage of new laws. Uh, there were five presidents from 1877 to 1893. Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, Chester A. Arthur, Grover Cleveland, and Benjamin Harrison. Close elections inspired fierce party loyalty among many voters. As early as the 1880s, though, other Americans became frustrated with electoral politics. Uh, Republicans had enacted emancipation uh, and other major achievements, but after Reconstruction ended, uh, the Republicans gradually became defenders of the economic status quo. Disillusioned with both Republicans and Democrats, some reformers created new parties. For a brief moment in the early 1890s, it appeared that a new People's Party might displace Republicans in the South or Democrats in the West and become a major party in its own right. New initiatives in the 1880s then is our next subsection. After the assassination of President Garfield in 1881, reform of the spoils system became urgent, even though this system was not the immediate motive for the murder. Prior to that, the president's most demanding task had been to dispense of political patronage. The Pendleton Act of 1883 created a list of jobs to be filled on the basis of examinations administered by the new Civil Service Commission, but patronage still accounted for the bulk of government posts. Leaders of the Civil Service Movement included many proponents of classical liberalism, a term that was used very differently in the late 19th century than it is today. 
At the time, the word liberal was used to describe those Americans, especially former Republicans, who became disillusioned with Reconstruction and advocated more limited and professionalized government. In 1890, Congress extended pensions to all Union veterans, uh, whether or not they were disabled, to protect them from poverty once they reached old age. Republicans also yielded to growing public outrage over trusts by passing the law to regulate interstate corporations. Though it proved difficult to enforce and was soon weakened by the Supreme Court, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 was the first federal attempt to forbid any, quote, combination in the form of trust or otherwise or conspiracy in restraint of trade. President Benjamin Harrison sought to protect black voting rights in the South. Uh, he found allies in Congress. Uh, Massachusetts Representative Henry Cabot Lodge drafted a bill to create a bipartisan federal elections board. Whenever 100 citizens in any district or city of 20,000 or more appealed for intervention, the board would investigate. If they found sufficient evidence of fraud or disfranchisement, uh, they could work with federal courts to seat the rightful winner. Now, amid cries of outrage from Southern Democrats who warned that this so-called force bill meant, quote, Negro supremacy, the House passed the measure. But the bill met deep resistance in the South. Uh, Northern liber liberals who wanted the best men to rule through professional expertise thought it provided for too much democracy. Most damaging of all, was the opposition of Republicans from the Trans-Mississippi West. With the entry of 10 new states since 1863 and thus 20 new U.S. Senators, Westerners had gained enormous clout. Senator William Stewart of Nevada, who had Southern family ties, claimed Lodge's proposal would bring monarchy or revolution. He and his allies killed the, boat, the vote uh, uh, kill, I'm sorry, killed the bill by a single vote. The defeat was a devastating blow to those who sought to defend black voting rights. The episode marked the demise of the party of emancipation. All right, so this brings us now to our last section, the populist program. In Kansas, a state chock full of union veterans and railroad boosters, uh, Republicans dominated the political scene they treated the Kansas Farmers Alliance with contempt. In a breakthrough election in 1890, the alliance joined with the state Knights of Labor and created a new People's Party. They stunned the nation by capturing four-fifths of the lower house of the Kansas legislature and most of the state's congressional seats. The victory electrified Knights of Labor and Alliance members nationwide. Uh, in July of 1892, delegates from these groups met at Omaha, Nebraska, and formally created the National People's Party. They nominated former Union General and Greenbacker James B. Weaver for president. In November, the Populists, as they became known, uh, captured a million votes and carried four Western states. Though farmers' votes were its chief instrument of victory, the People's Party attracted support from other groups. Uh, labor planks won the movement a strong base among such groups as Alabama steelworkers and miners in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, Anti-liquor and women's suffrage leaders, including Frances Willard and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, attended the party's organizing conferences in 1891 and in 1892, uh, hoping that populists would adopt their causes, but they were disappointed. Okay, so this does conclude our lecture for today. Um, at this time, go ahead and answer your review questions and continue with your notes.